So welcome to the Kanban Coaching Exchange this fine Thursday evening. We've got a very exciting event tonight with a speaker who we've never had before, but it's great to see so many of you joining us from all over the world. Uh, we're a pretty a diverse group of countries now that come along to this session, so I love to see all of the different places. And I also get holiday ideas as well. So tonight, we're honoured to have Cliff Hazel join us. And I first met Cliff through his work with the Flight Levels Academy um, because I actually went on his course because I wanted to learn all about flight levels and how you can use it to scale in your organization and understand how the work flows through the overall system. So that was a great opportunity for me and Flight Levels Academy, if it's not something that you've had a look at, definitely take a look. But Cliff also works as a trainer and as a consultant, um, helping us and of organizations evolve, um, specifically in the wider organization where we're looking to scale and some of the dysfunctions that we have around there. He's also a pretty nice guy. And interesting fact, he worked at Spotify. He's probably not going to talk about that today, but I always think that's interesting because everyone's like, oh, Spotify. And we all want to know, was it really like that, Cliff? But that's a beer conversation, I imagine. Anyway, that's enough of me rambling. We're going to hand you over to the fabulous Cliff. Take it away, my dear. Thank you, Helen, for the lovely introduction. Uh, let me just do the famous can you see my slides moment uh, and just check. I can see from Zoom that everyone can see my slides. Oh. Um, and I have a small request. Uh, it would be lovely if I could see as many faces as possible. Uh, I totally don't expect all of you to do so, but it's nice to be able to see you uh, smiling or nodding along or shaking your head or something like this. Um, I prefer a little bit of interactive audience. Um, so if you if you are able to, uh, please hit uh, the camera on button. Uh, and lastly, just before I jump in, uh, I will have the chat open. I'm quite happy to uh, kind of make it a little bit more interactive. So if you've got thoughts or comments as we're going, uh, please feel free to type stuff in the chat. Um, but there will be some time for questions at the end as well. So uh, we'll see how we go with that. Cool. So let's jump in then. Uh, the talk is titled Beyond Copy Paste Agile. Uh, and I'll jump into that in a second. But first, I want to ask if anybody can tell me where this is. Have you perhaps had the privilege of even having been here, maybe? That's Apple headquarters, isn't it? It's where, sorry? Apple headquarters. It's actually, that that's an interesting one. I have not heard uh, that as an answer. It is, that's actually the World Cup Stadium in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, and in the background, you can see uh, the wonderful Table Mountain. So I'll show you this picture because this is where my story starts. Uh, I did not, uh, I was not born here, but I kind of grew up uh, in the Agile community. Uh, I worked in product management in telecoms uh, for a big uh, internet service provider over here. I was hanging out, kind of doing my thing, enjoying, uh, as you can see from the picture, some quite lovely weather. Uh, and some folks from another place uh, contacted me and said, would you like to come and live here instead? Does anyone know where, where this is? I can uh -huh. see that Maro has done some homework uh, and perhaps knows a little bit about what's going on, or perhaps has seen some of uh, my talking before. Um, so as Helen alluded to earlier, this is uh, 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 Stockholm, uh, which is the headquarters of Spotify. Uh, the company, if some of you maybe don't know that, is actually a Swedish-based company. Uh, I joined the company when it was about 700 people. Uh, I left four and a half years later when the company was just crossing the threshold of 5,000 people. Uh, so as you can imagine, there was quite a lot of crazy growth uh, on the go. And one of the things that I always encountered with this was people, uh, as maybe some of you do, having questions about uh, Spotify and the Spotify model. This talk actually evolved out of some of those conversations. Uh, and I guess at some level, a little bit of kind of curiosity from my side about people wanting to copy Spotify. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting things that could be uh, kind of learned from or taken uh, from some of the stories. But the challenge, of course, uh, is that often what we do is we copy without necessarily considering uh, what problems that we have. You see this with OKRs, you see it with a number of things. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story just to kind of start off um, my presentation here. 
So imagine a kid is watching their parents cooking dinner. Uh, and as you can imagine, for those of you who've had kids, uh, the favorite question of kids is always what? It is to ask why. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? The kid notices that at some point, uh, the parents are, just before they put the chicken in the oven, they cut a piece off uh, and slot it into the pan and then stick it into the oven. And the kid, of course, is like, well, why do you do this? What's the story? Parents look at each other and they realize, well, actually, we don't know what the story is. Uh, and so uh, they realize that they'd learned it from their parents. So they go and ask the parents. And they say, well, what's the story with this? Uh, turns out that they had learned it also from their parents. And so for the sake of a good story, uh, the great grandparents are still alive and they plan a little visit and they go and they ask them, they get met with laughter. Why is this so funny? Uh, the grandparents look at each other and they say, well, my dears, when we got married, we did not have a lot of money. We did not have a very big oven. And thus the only way to fit the chicken into the oven was to cut a piece off of it in order to get it into the pan. Now, the reason that I tell you the story is because I think this is very similar to what I see a lot of companies doing. As I said already, you know, we do this with the Spotify model, we do this with OKRs, you might be doing this with Scrum or Kanban or anything else. Uh, we tend to kind of borrow things from other organizations without necessarily being aware of the situations that led them to make those choices and pick those approaches in the first place. So I want to be clear, I'm not saying copying is bad, but maybe take a little bit of time to kind of understand what were the reasons and motivations behind this. So let me dig into this a little bit because I think it kind of sets the stage. So for those of you who've inter ever interviewed at a company, uh, quite commonly, if you're interviewing there, um, maybe the recruiter or some of the people who you're interviewing with, they will tell you the story of describing the company or their, their sort of metaphor will be something a little bit like the oven that you currently see on the screen. It's new, it's shiny, it's fancy, it's all kinds of, you know, the latest bells and whistles, everything is super smart and so on. But the reality, of course, is that that is just our perception. And it might be that we're actually dealing with a slightly different situation. Maybe uh, the oven actually looks a little bit more like this, right? Also a perfectly valid oven, uh, perhaps a wonderful way to cook. But the opportunities and possibilities of what's possible with this is a little bit different, right? Now, for those of you who've been through the interview process, you probably recognize a little bit of maybe the overselling that happens. And perhaps after some period of time at the company, uh, you realize that the oven is not so much like this, uh, but perhaps a little bit more something like this. Uh, and maybe even after a couple of years, you start to notice that there's certain things uh, where maybe it's a little bit more like this, yeah? So as I said, why is perception important? Well, the reality is that if you look at these three different methods of cooking, uh, each of these has great different strengths and perhaps some weaknesses, but the capabilities and possibilities, as I say, are quite different. I don't know if you've ever tried to make a pizza in a microwave, uh, it, it probably doesn't work so well, yeah? And so what I wanna do is really encourage you to look at the things that I'm talking about over the course of this talk through this lens of how does it relate to the circumstances and situations that we're actually having? I posed this question of how do we go beyond copy paste agile? That is kind of the framing that I want to explore. And I want to suggest to you with a, perhaps a little bit of a spoiler alert, there's three specific things that I think we can do and three lenses that I want to explore this through. So uh, I like to think of it as when we're trying to move beyond copy-paste agile, what we're trying to do within the organization is create focus, find leverage, and build habits to sustain those activities. And I want to explore this a little bit over the next few minutes with you through three different lenses, as I said. Firstly, systems. How do all of the parts fit together, the interactions between all of the pieces? Secondly, science. How do we learn and validate what we're doing? And sapiens being the humans and taking into account the human factors uh, and all of our wonderful diversity, creativity, and the skills that we have. Cool. So I'm just going to jump straight in. First up we have systems, or as I've written here, creating focus using interactions between your flight levels. How many of you have experienced this? You've probably seen something like this in your experience. 
I think if you've ever been maybe working across multiple teams, or maybe if you've been sort of a key employee on any kind of project or program of work, uh, or maybe your company is just set up to kind of organize things in this way, um, I think we see this very common or very commonly. And part of this is perhaps, I think, a little bit because of what we tend to do in our organizations uh, is that we're basically behaving as leaders, managers, and individuals. We're looking at a picture like this, which you've probably seen before with the title like high utilization or something along these lines. What we're basically doing is if you can see my mouse here, you are looking at that gap between all of these cars and going, well, there's a little bit of space. Uh, we could certainly be more efficient. And so what we will do is we will add some new work into the mix and perhaps increase, uh, I guess the theory is increase the throughput of the system, right? So what's the problem with this? Uh, I think we've all seen this in a couple of different ways, um, but the way that I like to talk about this is to imagine the company as a keyboard. Uh, and quite simply, if we are in the business, say, of writing letters for our customers, um, a customer comes to us and says, what I would like to do is have a love letter. What we've done is we've organized ourselves as if we are, you know, one row of the keyboard. Um, maybe you've seen something like this before, right? Each team has certain sets of responsibilities. But of course, as the company grows, what we tend to do is we specialize even further. And we end up with a situation where each team is responsible for actually only a single key on the keyboard. The challenge for this, of course, is that the typical approach of a lot of agile approaches and methods, and especially if we're copying and pasting from others, is that they tend to focus a lot on trying to get the team that pushes the A key to push the A key as fast as possible. But for those of you who have ever tried to write a letter, uh, you probably know that a lot of A keys or pushing any one of the keys as fast as possible isn't the thing that actually produces a really great letter. What we need to try to do, yeah, as Tony says, starting a letter for perhaps any point in the letter, just going, ah, that's a little bit, I don't know, strange. What we're trying to do here is actually create something that is a meaningful letter. And in order to do that, what we need to do is go beyond this idea of trying to optimize how fast we push any one of the keys and think much more about the interactions between the different keys or the teams. So it's really much more about trying to get the right team doing the right thing at the right time. What this means is that we're actually talking about feedback loops. And what this is, is that I like to use this picture. It's one of probably one of my favorite pictures uh, on the internet. Uh, I think that we need a healthy dose of this every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there's a reason for this, right? Uh, Don Reinitzen, uh, probably if you've ever been to any kind of Kanban conference or meetup, you've heard of Don Reinitzen before. Uh, but he has a fantastic quote. He says that in order to decentralize decision making, there's two things where we need to be careful of, right? It's not just the autonomy or the, the authority, at least, to make decisions, right? What we also need to do is make sure that we provide the information to be able to make good decisions as well. So if I don't know when the other team is pushing a key, uh, or I don't know what key is next in the sequence, it's quite hard for me to actually do what is most effective for the entire uh, system of production and create a good letter for the customer. So what I want to do is encourage you uh, as the first step is to go beyond the team level. We need to zoom out and focus on the interactions between the teams, not just on trying to optimize how fast we push each key. Yeah. Cool. So let's look at the second part of this challenge. Some of you have probably seen something like this before. Uh, I mean, this is a, a Kanban meetup after all. So probably you have seen many variations of this done uh, in a number of different ways. The question that I like to ask is that, well, once we are flowing the work, or as we are flowing the work through here, what we end up with uh, as we get to done, is that actually done in terms of delivering value to the customer? And the simple truth is that actually, there's probably some other steps in between there that we have maybe hidden away. And if we keep asking the sort of five whys sort of style, what we find is that maybe there's also some waiting for acceptance in addition to the integration, and maybe there's something like a release. Uh, and also what we start to notice is that these things tend to not happen on the same cadence or rhythm uh, that we are doing the software development. So if we are that A key uh, pressing team, we are pushing the team super fast to get through the develop stage. 
but then we're sitting waiting for a monthly, quarterly release, integration, customer deployment, something like this. The good news, though, is that in this case, once we get to done, uh, done is actually done and the work is in the customer's hands. But of course, the real part of the story is that there is a whole bunch of stuff happening to the left hand side of this picture as well. So let's explore a little bit. Maybe there's something, you know, like a development backlog. Uh, perhaps there's even a product backlog in front of that. Uh, and quite likely in front of that, you have some steering committees, some approval processes, a whole bunch of you know, pools of new ideas, uh, these kinds of things. When you zoom out, of course, you start to see that there's quite a lot of things on the go. Uh, and as we already saw, not all of those things are happening in a totally agile fashion. And of course, what we've done when we're trying to do uh, some kind of agile transformation is that we're doing the agile bits and sprinkling some agile magic uh, over here in the development stage. The net result, well, we're super agile. Yeah, not necessarily a great, great outcome. The problem is that basically what we've optimized for is trying to keep uh, our focus on the teams as if that's where the problem lies. And as we saw with the keyboard metaphor, the reality is that we're not really trying to try to get each team to move as fast as possible. We're trying to get the right team doing the right thing at the right time. So the thing I want you to take away from this is that what we need to be doing in this case is we need to be visualizing the end-to-end -end flows, right? The full value stream from start to finish, right? Catchy phrases if you like them, vision to value or from concept to cash, something like this, yeah? So the second or third, sorry, uh, piece that I'd like to explore a little bit here is perhaps uh, what you're doing is despite the fact that you've seen this picture and you know all about whip limits and theory of constraints and a whole bunch of these things, you're still in the habit, uh, despite the evidence of saying, but there's still space for things. And I want to show you an example of how we started to address this at a company level uh, at Spotify. So quite simply what we have here, um, this is a, in flight levels language, it's a flight level two system. So uh, maybe a portfolio Kanban system. It spans multiple teams within a single value stream or a tribe. Uh, and on the right-hand side where I have the very handy big red arrow pointing towards a set of green post-it notes, those are labeled current bets. They are also numbered, uh, if you can see there, number one through six. If you have followed me for more than five seconds on Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, you will have heard me talk about this multiple times. The idea here is that what we're trying to do is get to a space where number three on the list does not block number one. So what that means is in a couple of different ways, I'm working on number three and you're working on number one. If you need my help, I should stop what I'm doing and switch to help you within some reasonable time frame or sensible manner. Like still use your brain, still think about it, but it makes sense that I should shift and work. If I'm working on number three and I need your help, however, you're working on number one, probably I shouldn't interrupt you because I already know that. So I don't field, make you field all of these questions and interruptions to shift your focus away. Uh, and however, if I do interrupt you for some reason, uh, you're well within uh, the expected behavior to say, actually, sorry, dude, I'm busy on the number one thing for the company. Can you come back You know, next week, next month, next year, whenever it is, or, Here's somebody you could chat to who can help you with the thing. Please refer to whatever other information is available. The idea is quite simple. Uh, the point for me here is that it's not so important, actually, in the early stages of doing something like this, which one we pick as number one. Uh, in my experience, most companies will make a relatively good guess about what is number one. The point is that we need to have a number one, because if we do not have a number one, everything is competing. And you've probably seen this, you know, marketing, finance, HR, and the customer call center all give your team their own individual backlogs. Which one is actually important? You know, as you know, if everything is top priority, nothing is top priority. So what I want you to do is take away this idea of not letting number three block number one. We need to sequence our work so that we can avoid making further traffic jams. So you might be wondering, well, how do we do this? What, what actually is sort of the approach to this? Some of you may have heard of the concept of flight levels. Uh, the idea is quite simple. Uh, it's 
like a lot of things in the agile world, quite easy to grasp, but the practice, the habits, and the kind of behaviors of building it and doing it on a consistent basis, that's actually where it becomes tricky. So how does it work? Think of your organization roughly in three levels. There's a lot of nuance inside here, but I will skip over it and we can sort of unpack a bit of it, maybe in the questions. Three levels. At the top, we have something like the strategy level, you know, kind of the big bets that the company is placing. Uh, at the bottom, we have something like the operational level. This is where typically teams would be doing Scrum or Kanban uh, or whatever other methodology you're using. And in the middle, we have what we call coordination. And the idea here is that you can coordinate either a value stream, a stream of products, a set of customer needs, uh, whatever it is. Um, but what we're doing is basically getting a bunch of teams at level one together to help build a flight level two system and connect it to the strategy through the flight level two system. There's a lot more I could say about flight levels, but in the interest of being able to finish on time and have quite a bit of time for some questions, uh, I'm going to give you a quick recap and then some perhaps reading material that you can consider as well. So we've talked about this uh, as basically three uh, separate points. So I said, go beyond the team level firstly, Stop thinking about pushing the A key as fast as possible and focus on the right team doing the right thing. So visualize your end-to-end -end flows and go beyond the team level. And secondly, we explored this idea of not letting number three be blocked by number one, uh, and that helps us to avoid creating traffic jams. I'm sure none of you need more books on your reading list. Uh, if you are good agile people, as I suspect you are, uh, then uh, feel free to ignore this, but if you do like what I'm talking about and you'd like to dig in a little bit further, uh, three books that I think can be super helpful in this. Uh, firstly is Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows, a uh, fantastic book on everything to do with systems thinking. Uh, it explores examples far beyond just what we often sort of look at in sort of an academic sense. Uh, it looks at ecosystems, it looks at governmental and societal systems, technology, all kinds of things. Uh, it's essentially, I think in Sweden at least, it is the textbook uh, for systems thinking when you study it at university. Uh, the second book is Thinking, uh, Rethinking Agile by Klaus Leopold. Uh, there's Tomo holding up his copy, very nice. Um, yeah, I think uh, probably there's a few of you who have a copy of this book. It digs into the concept of flight levels uh, and tells some of the origin story and also some of the use cases um, in a lot more detail than I, I have time for this evening. Uh, and the final book is called Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry. Uh, this book is fantastic. Uh, it talks about basically how to build an effective strategy deployment system in your product organization. Cool. So that is systems. Shall we take a look at science? Cool. So the topic of science for me is about exploring or finding ways uh, to explore leverage uh, through observation and experimentation. And essentially what we're trying to do is understand a little bit what happens when we get here, right? Something lands in done. Uh, did it do what we wanted? If you take a moment just to think for yourself, uh, what was the result of your last delivery? Do you have something that you could type in chat or uh, that would be great? Do you, do you know the result of the last thing that you shipped? I asked this with a show of hands a few days ago. Um, I was doing this talk in Tallinn and I was amazed that about only about six hands out of about 250 people um, went up. Uh, so a very small percentage of folks were able to say that they could point uh, at the results of their last delivery. Part of the challenge with this, I think, uh, is that there are several factors. Partly uh, what we tend to do is we just forget uh, to actually check. Uh, we are very focused on delivering. And once something is out the door, we tend not to look a little bit further and see what actually happened. Uh, there are of course also other things such as, you know, sometimes it takes a while for the results to come back. The results can be complicated and complex. But the biggest difference for me is what we're trying to explore here is a little bit the difference between output and outcome. Uh, 
A lot of the organization, as we explored earlier with the keyboard example, is we're very focused on pushing the A key as fast as possible, but we don't really focus on the letter. Did we write a good letter? Did the customer like the letter? Did they get a second date as a result of that letter? You know, these kind of things. Yeah. So what we're doing uh, is a little bit essentially like this. Um, we've done a ton of experimentation. We've shipped a lot of things, but we haven't necessarily created the thing that we set out to create. Yeah? We're making cures, producing side effects, perhaps not the point. So why is it that we so rarely know the outcomes of what we deliver? Well, I think a lot of organizations struggle with this in a number of different ways. I don't know how many of you have ever watched South Park, um, but the underpants gnomes, Jeff Patton actually has a wonderful article about this using this exact metaphor, which I didn't know about until uh, I think he saw my talk and was like, I wrote an article about this and, and sent me the link. Basically, what we do is we, we have this grand idea. We're going to go out as the gnomes in the story do, uh, and we're going to collect all the underpants. And then in the magical middle step of number two, something cool is going to happen, dot, dot, dot. But the third step is always going to be profit. The challenge with this is that if we don't think about how to connect phase one and phase three, we run the risk of having this big question mark as you have here. And so we're busy doing things and shipping stuff, running around like the gnomes collecting all the underpants, and yet somehow not always resulting in profit. We tend to be quite poor uh, at a number of things around data gathering and extrapolation. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, the comic XKCD. It is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, and this example in particular, I think, illustrates something that we do quite often as human beings. We make assumptions and extrapolations a little bit like the underpants gnomes. If I do this, then, you know, for infinite uh, results, we are going to keep, uh, or we're going to keep having uh, infinite recurrence of that exact thing. But for me, the question is, well, why do we do this? Um, I'm going to recommend quite a few more books and suggest and allude to them. Uh, this is just so that you can uh, dig into the stuff a little bit further if you're interested. Um, Jonathan Haidt in this book, uh, The Righteous Mind, wonderful book, uh, he tells a story about how we like to think of ourselves as human beings as if we are logical, rational decision-making beings. We gather some data, we analyze it, we make a decision, and then we take action. And what he says is actually that we have this totally the wrong way around. We are rational beings, but we tend not to use it so much for decision-making. We tend to use it to explain decisions that we've already made instinctively and intuitively, right? So we make the decision and then use our rational ability to construct a story that explains why we did what we did. There is another way to look at this. Uh, and Annie Duke explores this, this quite extensively in her fantastic book, Thinking in Bets. She talks about the concept of resulting. And what we tend to do is we tend to evaluate whether or not a decision was a good choice based on the outcome. In other words, did it achieve an outcome that we like rather than whether or not the information was sensible that we used when we made the decision? So quite simply, uh, if I play poker as Annie Duke does and I win a hand, I assume because I won, I am good at poker, rather than I got lucky, all the odds were in my favor. The problem with this is that we tend to make quite poor decisions in a lot of situations as a result of this. So what I want to encourage you to do is if you're finding that you tend to have a lot of delivery and it's kind of very sort of just ship it sort of focus within your organization, not quite as much focus on results or maybe a lot of things where like you're delivering stuff and you're not necessarily able to see the results. This is where I would like to recommend that you start. Write down your hypothesis, whether this is for a project, a feature, uh, or a change initiative that you're planning, write it down in advance. I do this in my personal life. I make an investment decision or I join a company or any kind of big life decision. Write down what is my expected outcome, right? I'm expecting some things to happen. And if you can also note the information that you're using to make that decision at the time. What this allows us to do is then look back in the future and say, given now that we have some information about the outcomes, we also have some new information that's available. What do we actually think about the quality of that decision, right? It could turn out that maybe we could have done something better about the information gathering, or maybe 
we just made a really, you know, the decision was sound, but the outcome was not necessarily in our favor. And so we can do a better job of overcoming what any, any Duke calls resulting. One way to think about this, if you're struggling to come up with good ways to capture your hypothesis, is one of two options. Firstly, is to write down, if we had this today, what would the benefit of it be? Yeah? You get bonus points if you can quantify it, uh, especially in a business context, in terms of money or some kind of customer impact or some kind of metric that the business cares about. It would increase or decrease the frequency of a certain thing happening by how much. Put it in real terms. Now you can start to compare in the future. Another way to think about this is to say, well, what assumptions would need to be true in order for this to work? Yeah. Very often what this will do is will highlight a number of the things that you find that are being just kind of glossed over because they are hidden assumptions. And now you can start to question, challenge, and perhaps even modify them down the line. So I said, quantify your hypothesis and reflect before and during and after, yeah? So, very often, what I find is that people who are in the situation of the slide that I showed you earlier, uh, we kind of wonder, well, what would happen if maybe we just, you know, work harder in this situation? Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you have tried that in the past? Uh, you're facing a mountain of work and you just, just throw yourself at it and see what happens. My experience, it might work for a short period of time, yeah, maybe a few days, maybe even a week, uh, but you're pretty shattered by the end of it. Uh, and usually it has some longer term consequences if you try to sustain it for a while. Um, aside from mental health and your own energy levels, uh, my experience is that the first thing that starts to drop is quality. Uh, you might get a lot done, but you tend to have to do a lot of rework and fixing down the line. Uh, and I want to put to you that part of the challenge here is that the solution is not actually to work harder in this case. I think that what you work on matters far more than how hard you work, right? It's very easy uh, to think about this in the sense of if you are digging a hole, uh, you could, of course, use your hands uh, to dig that hole, but you will be very quickly surpassed by the person using a shovel, yeah? What we want to do is look for leverage. There are many things in this world that give us enormous amounts of advantage, and yet we don't use them for a variety of different reasons. One of my favorite examples of this is the bicycle. Uh, bicycle is not a massively expensive tool. It's not even particularly rare technology. Uh, but if you look at this simple table, the distance and the speed at which a human being can travel with the same amount of energy, I mean, it's three and a half times further, yeah? Your traveling speed is two and a half times. It is a substantial, substantial increase. This is the kind of thing that we're looking for. So I want to give you an example of some, uh, how I use this in the work environment. Uh, the story I call how we built a retrospective machine. So I'm sure most of you, uh, if you've been in some sort of scrum master or agile coach type role, what you've found is that you get a lot of requests uh, to do something like run a retrospective. Um, and the challenge with this is that it's a little bit like the metaphor of giving someone a fish versus teaching them to fish. Uh, what you're doing is you're providing the fish every time. Uh, and while that might be beneficial for a short term uh, circumstance, what we tried to do in this situation uh, was to solve the problem by rather teaching folks how to fish for themselves. So what did we do? Uh, we recognized that a few hundred folks uh, were in need of retrospectives. So we sent out a call for requests. Who would like to learn how to run good retrospectives? You can sign up over here. Uh, and we ran a short training program. Uh, it was a half, I think it was a half day kind of session digging into uh, Esther Derby's book, uh, Retrospective Facilitation. Uh, and we looked at the topic. What are the five things or the five steps? We explored some of the theory behind it. Uh, and then paired up with individuals to support them as they ran their first few uh, over the next few weeks and months. The second piece that we did was we created a essentially a request space where anybody could jump on Slack and say, hey, my team would like to get a third party facilitator for our retrospective. Uh, could someone help us out? 
Uh, and so uh, picking a name, Jen, that I see here on the call, maybe Jen, you say, look, my team would like to do something. Uh, can somebody come and run this retrospective? Tony, you say, yeah, sure, I'm available next Tuesday. You go and run retrospective. And aside from just solving the need for the retrospective, what you start to see is the social and lateral linking across teams within the organization being created. Now you know a little bit of context about each other's team. Uh, maybe you do a bit of a swap. You know, One week you do one for this team and the next team they return the favor. This kind of thing for me, I think is a hugely powerful example of building capability into an organization rather than just trying to you know, fulfill the immediate need. Uh, and I could tell you other examples and stories of a similar thing. So especially for those of you who are working in a change type of situation, uh, I really caution against especially doing something, and I don't say never ever do it, but if you end up basically injecting yourself to fulfill the function, as opposed to teaching the org how to fulfill its own needs, uh, you're going to end up in that cycle of just constantly having to deliver the same thing. So the way I phrased it earlier uh, was that you want to find the leverage. And for me, the key here is that uh, we're really trying to focus on what we are working on, not just trying to work harder. So there are two points uh, in this section uh, on science. Uh, the first one is quantify your hypothesis, write it down, use it to reflect and learn uh, based on the outcomes that you uh, deliver. And secondly, is to look for leverage. You want to work smart and not hard. If you'd like to dig into any of these topics a little bit further, uh, three books that I can suggest, the two on the outer edges I talked about already, Thinking and Bets and The Righteous Mind. Uh, and the one in the middle is a book called Polarity Management, which is probably one of my favorite recent uh, concept, uh, concepts that I discovered. Um, Basically, the idea is that it talks about the kinds of problems that we can't solve because they're, well, quite simply, not problems. Uh, they are polarities. A simple example of this is if you've noticed the pattern of organizations tending to go, this year we're centralizing everything in design, next year we're decentralizing everything in design. Maybe you've done this with certain types of technology or whatever. That is an example of a polarity and something that could be better managed in a way where you find balance rather than just constantly going from one back and forth to the other. Give it a read if you find it interesting. Cool. So the third and final piece of my talk for this evening is on sapiens uh, or the wonderful diversity of human beings. I see there's a couple of questions in the chat. I'm gonna circle back to them. Uh, afterwards if that's okay how many of you have heard the saying you can just nod your head you've heard this idea of people resist change yeah i think we've we've all at least heard it in some form uh, maybe you've heard even the slightly stronger version of this which is you know all won't work or won't work on that unless we tell them or tell them what to do now the challenge for me with this is that there's a, well, there's a number of problems with this, but it seems to be implying for me, at least, that there is some kind of dead wood within the organization. You have poor performance or bad people. Now, I want to say that if you have dead wood in your company, there's only two ways it got there. Either you hired dead wood or you hired live wood and you killed it. Both of these are the responsibility of yourselves and the company to address, right? The issue here, I think, is stemming largely from the fact that we tend to think of organizations primarily through a bunch of broken metaphors. We tend to think of things as machines, right? I'm sure all of you have heard this explanation to some extent before. Uh, human beings are not interchangeable. We are not the same. Uh, a better metaphor for thinking about these kind of things is something like ecology or a forest or forestry system. To illustrate my point, uh, if you are trying to grow trees, what do you do if you want to try to create this? You do not go and give them a courtly OKR. You do not put values posters on the walls. You do not individually incentivize them and give them performance targets. These kind of things do not create good, healthy forests. I would argue that they probably don't even work. 
Uh, and certainly shouting at them and trying to discipline them individually is not likely to have much of an effect. What do you do instead? Well, you plant at the right season and you water them just enough, but not too much. You make sure that they get some sunlight, but they, that are not too much in the sun. You basically take care of the environment. You create a healthy conditions so that good trees can grow, right? It's a fundamentally and totally different metaphor for thinking about organizational design and creating healthy environments. And we've known this for a while. We don't tend to listen, unfortunately, too often to this. There is another piece of this, though, that I think is part of the challenge. Uh, and I'm wondering if anybody could tell me, do you know what is happening in this picture? Any guesses? A couple of different guesses, yeah. So I'll be honest, the first time I saw this picture, I thought it was probably something like a graduation ceremony, maybe a wedding, somebody's come home, something like this. Yeah. Sri has the, the correct answer. Uh, this is actually the team uh, of ISRO, or Indian Space Agency scientists, celebrating the successful launch of a Mars lander. Uh, to give you some context, they did it the first time around uh, for a tenth of the budget that any country has done it since or before, so a tenth of the budget. And to further drive that point, they did it for less money than Hollywood made the movie The Martian. They put an actual spaceship in orbit around Mars for less than the price of a movie. Yeah. These are some of the world's best scientists. And yet when we look at this picture, our go-to is very rarely, these are scientists. We have a bias that tells us that people who look like this are probably not that likely to be scientists, right? And this is a problem. I want to show you a second picture. Can you tell me what's going on in this one? Probably making a decision about abortions or something that's got nothing to do with men, most likely. You are unfortunately almost exactly right, Gordon. Uh, the guy in the middle here, this is Mike Pence, who was the vice president when Donald Trump was the president. Uh, putting aside the politics, because I don't think it's only to do with the political you know, parties that were involved. Uh, this is the Council on Women's Rights or Women's Reproductive Rights specifically. Uh, and as you've pointed out, there is absolutely no possible way that this group could ever make a good decision on that topic. Because quite simply, nobody who's affected by the problem is in the room, yeah? So I want to explore this a little bit with you and then we're going to shift over and take some questions. For me, the key issue here is that exclusion hides vital perspective and information, right? We cannot consider a perspective that is not represented in the room. So when you're in a situation where meeting a leader feels like being the kid on the right-hand side, yeah, it's not just about being present, it's also about how much you can participate in the conversation. Perhaps you feel this way when you're making a suggestion to your company about what to improve or change. Maybe your retrospectives even feel this way. Would not surprise me at all if your restructuring process, if you've ever been through one of these, certainly often feels like this. And I know for many people, performance review certainly feels this way, yeah? The challenge for me is that perspective matters. Uh, and I think that we really need to take this account. And the reason that perspective matters, I think is nicely illustrated with this picture. The same thing is going on in both photos, right? But where you stand shows you a totally different perspective. So why does this happen? Well, millions of years ago, uh, your ancestors and mine uh, were probably roaming around not too far actually from Cape Town. Uh, and if something yellow jumped out from behind the bush and was chasing them, uh, they don't have time to sit and go, well, you know, it's yellow, it's moving quite fast. I think it's coming in my direction. Looks like it might be hungry. By this stage, you are ready lunch, yeah? 
So what do we do instead? We develop a habit of making a fast fit pattern match rather than a best fit pattern match. If it looks like a line, you run the hell away. You don't stick around to find out because you don't get to see tomorrow. Yeah. What this means is that we have developed certain characteristics, certain traits, and certain cognitive abilities that are beneficial in some situations, such as escaping a lion, but problematic when we are doing things like hiring or wondering about the previous pictures that I showed you. Yeah? We tend to not think of Indian women as scientists as an example of that. So what I think we need to do is we need to intentionally design ways around our biases. We need to firstly acknowledge that they exist and be aware of them. And I don't think beat ourselves on the back or beat ourselves on the head because we're you know, bad people or whatever, but I think we need to design around them. So I want to explore this a little bit. If you think about the idea of diversity as being invited to the party, think of inclusion as choosing the music. What that means is that if you are all managers, all white, all men, all wearing the same color tie, whatever, yeah, invite some people who are different. This will address the first piece, right? We want to try to have as much variety as possible to be able to have a better set of perspective in the room. The second thing that we need to do is we need to address the way that we design our spaces so that everyone can participate in a healthy and productive manner. Now, I want to give you two concrete examples that maybe help to illustrate this point. The first one, uh, this is a pattern that I like to use uh, for check-in across uh, sort of, say, from a, a team or a squad uh, up to the tribe level or up to another level within the organization. Quite simply, uh, you've probably seen something like this before, but I want to draw attention to specifically the three at the end. So what we have quite simply, firstly, what have we achieved or learned since we last met? Uh, what are we planning to do by the time we meet next time around? What's on our minds as number three? What are we stressed by, number four? And perhaps most importantly, of that or given those things, what do we need help with? The reason why this is important is because as leaders, what we often tend to make the assumption is, is that if someone is stressed by something, they want our help, right? And this is very often not the case. Not only do they often not want the help, but they might want help in a totally different manner. I want you to do air cover or distract that person so that they don't come and bother my team for a while while we do this thing. I don't need you to actually fix the problem that we're dealing with. Just keep everybody else in the loop, yeah? Something like this. The second example uh, is based on a pattern that I see often within organizations. I see a strong bias towards either written or verbal communication. And if I'm being honest, I think most often it's more towards verbal. We tend to stand up, make a presentation to announce some big change to the organization. We then say, any questions? Okay, no questions, thank you, cool, back to work, yeah? The problem with this is that if you got any answers to those questions, or if you actually got questions, what you would be getting is the questions from the people who thought something on the top of their head, and you tend not to get the questions that have been deliberated on and the deeper level of thinking. My first thoughts are usually not my best. Maybe this is true for you. Uh, and certainly if we're dealing with something as complex as a large organizational change or big architectural decision, a customer you know, shift or whatever it is, we need to think about it. So some suggestions. Offer pre-reading so that people can read through something beforehand and then meet to discuss rather than to present. You could also, if you do present, give people some time to think. Yeah? Give them a weekend or a night or an evening not an hour or five minutes even, give them at least one night's sleep to think about a complicated problem. And then follow up. Yeah. Now that you've had some time, what do you think about this? Or explore it a little bit further. So if you want to dig into this in a little bit more detail, I can offer you again some more reading uh, to explore these topics. Uh, Three wonderful books that I can recommend. Um, I hope most of you know about Esther Derby already. Uh, this is her new book, uh, Seven Rules for Positive Productive Change. 
macro shifts or micro shifts, macro results. There's loads of fantastic ideas and concepts and thinking in this book. Uh, and for me, one thing that I find particularly interesting, she has a model in there called SEAM, um, which is the steering, enabling, enhancing, and makers. It's kind of the three levels of the organization. And I see this actually mapping quite nicely to the flight levels model we talked about earlier. Second book, uh, Edgar Schein. You should probably read several of his books, but this is the one that I would recommend today. Uh, Humble Inquiry, specifically a great book uh, if you can get senior leaders who struggle with asking questions instead of just telling people what to do, uh, this can be a great way for them to explore and build some of the comfort and skills in that space. Uh, and the third one, Multipliers. Uh, the book itself is fantastic, but there's an insert, a flyer in the middle uh, that has a table uh, of different skills and illustrates clearly where there are strengths versus where they can be problematic if you overuse them. Uh, that table alone is worth 10 times the price of the book, uh, and I would buy it just for the table and read the book at a later stage um, if, if you don't have time. So we've explored two topics in this space. So the first is acknowledging our bias, noticing firstly who's missing, and using our uh, this approach of designing around our bias to create coherent understanding and build this habit of connecting these different perspectives together. So I posed this question at the start, how do we move beyond copy paste agile? And we've explored it through three different lenses. Firstly, we looked at systems. Yeah. How do we create focus and the interactions across all of the flight levels end to end across the value streams? Secondly, we looked at it through the lens of science. How do we find leverage and shift from this conversation of being only about outputs to being more about outcomes using our hypotheses to reflect and learn. And finally, we looked at it through the lens of sapiens. How do we build a habit of designing around our biases so that we can get the benefit of all of these different wonderful perspectives of the beautiful people we have hired into our company? That is how I think we can create focus, find leverage, and build habits in our organization. And when I do this talk, often what I hear from people is this thing of, well, coaching, teaching, investing in our people, these kind of things. It's really, really it's quite expensive. But yeah. You know, for me, the question or the concern sounds a little bit like, well, what if we invest in them and they leave? I want to put it to you in closing. What if you don't and they stay? Last thing from me, uh, something has broken with my slide. Uh, it meant to say a little bit more. Um, if you've enjoyed this presentation uh, and hopefully also the questions that follow, uh, I would invite you to join me on LinkedIn. Um, I post every few days and share a bunch of my thinking around these topics and others. Uh, I'd be very happy to engage with you. Uh, and have further conversation. Uh, I love to connect with interesting folks and hear you know, what resonated, what do you find cool or interesting about the things that we've explored. Uh, so hit me up. Uh, I see Gordon, you have pasted a link in the chat so everyone can just click it, it's nice and easy. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk further with you and maybe uh, even answer some of the questions if we don't have time to get to everything uh, before the end of this evening. I wanna say thank you for your time. It's been wonderful. Uh, shall we open it up for some questions? Yeah, definitely. So if you've got a question, pop your hand up. And if you've got any questions that, and you don't want to put your hand up, feel free to pop them in the chat channel. Uh, we've got there a couple already. Um, Gordon had a question in the chat channel, which was, how do you get people to do the pre-read? <laughs> ah, the greatest challenge in life. What do you think, Cliff? I, I think there's two ways. One is that if, if you're not getting folks to do the pre-read, it's probably the case that you've overloaded them the rest of the time. Um, one pattern that I've seen quite a few companies use, and I've used it myself, is to actually allocate the first 15 or 20 minutes of the meeting to reading silently in the meeting. Um, that can be an option. Um, of course, you might not completely overcome the sort of let's think a little bit more deeply about it aspect of it. So find a way to make sure that you have some time. I, I often do a thing where I even book time slots with people, like here's your 30 minutes booked so that you can read the thing and then let's follow up afterwards. So um, yeah, finding a slot in everybody's calendar can be tricky, but those are 
some thoughts. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. Nice. I like the idea of booking a meeting of people or booking a slot in people's diaries specifically for them to read rather than actually attend. That's brilliant. <laughs> I love the idea. That's awesome. I'm going to do it. Oh, cool. Yeah. We've also got another question from Matthew. Um, where would you reckon your hypothesis sits on the various flight levels? Um, I, I would say, honestly, I've used it at all the different levels. Um, maybe the scale of the hypothesis would be different. So, you know, at, at the sort of operational level, it might be more feature or kind of story related, something like that. Um, at level two, it might be a little bit bigger about, you know, some sort of epic uh, initiative or kind of a story or something that we're exploring in that space. Uh, and at the company level um, or the strategy level, it might be something like a big bet. You know, we should get into that market. We should explore that you know, whatever, much larger concept, uh, something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think like everything, there's probably points where it's maybe less useful to use it, but I think very often uh, the, the, the idea is to get in the habit of at least writing down what are our assumptions. Like this is the data we use, this is what we're expecting to happen. And very often what you start to do is notice just some kind of, actually, that's not such a good idea, or we haven't thought about this enough. Let's think it through a little bit more. Like, don't leave out the question mark between collect underpants and get profit, basically, is what I'm saying. That's that's the hole you're trying to plug. I, I would also say, don't overstress it. I see, I see it with a lot of teams that are, say, using something like OKRs or whatever, or even introducing flight levels into the organization. We need to get it perfect before we ship it the first time around, and then it's like, we're, we're an iterative incremental approach. So take a step, write a hypothesis, and then on the next round, get better at writing hypothesis as well as the shipping. So don't get stuck in analysis paralysis and overthink it. Like as long as it's better than what you did last time, keep moving forward. And one, one thing that I always think about, because whenever I listen to talks like this at the meetup groups I always think like you're totally preaching to the converted here you're like we all get this and you know we want everybody to get it how do we kind of like get this message that you know kill your own trees kind of like thinking I love that how do we get that message wider in the organization to the people that really matter and I bet you if you could answer that question Cliff you'd be a millionaire by now but you know like what are your thoughts um I mean, there's several things that I've been trying to do to do exactly that. So the, the vast majority of the clients that I work with are actually in the space where they can do something about these things. Um, I think a big part of it is that it's sort of kind of maybe two things, one thought and one criticism, maybe. Uh, I'll start with the criticism first, then I'll share the thought. So often what I see happening in an agile space is that people spend a lot of energy telling everybody else what they're doing wrong. Uh, so managers are bad at this and leaders are bad at that. And like, that doesn't endear you to anybody. Um, you, there's no upside to it. You're, you're just going to frustrate everybody. If instead what you do as a suggestion is you lean in and learn to speak their language and understand the context and the problems that they face, right? Most managers, to be blunt, are not trying to be assholes, even if they come across that way in a day-to-day -day environment. It, it, nobody's really getting up in the morning going, yeah, that's what I want to do with my day. Like, that's just not a thing. It, it's a byproduct of certain other things. And if you can understand what is the pain and what is the need that they're trying to solve for. Um, so quite simple example, like there's a lot of problems in the organization that are not going to be addressed by better estimation at the team level. It, it just doesn't solve that problem. You can use it for certain things, but it's not going to solve an unknowable problem that we cannot tell when we are going to deliver that thing. And that's a real thing that people are going to feel some stress about. So if you're saying, well, we just don't plan, we don't have any estimates, like whatever, people are going to be like, well, I'm not trusting you. I need you to think through the thing and take me what is step one, step two, step three. And for some people, their mental model for that is going to be a roadmap or a Gantt chart. Okay, what do they need to know? Is there some way between what they're asking for and what you're saying let's do instead? And maybe you take some steps or work your way towards a healthier way. So, yeah, that would be my thought. I don't know if yeah. that helps. I mean, I, I totally, I mean, I'm asking for the massive, but it's kind of like, I get it, you know, speak their language, find out what their problems are. But, you know, thinking about an, 
an organisation that I might have been with, um, I often get told, well, we have to do more. There has to be more. What can you do? And I'm thinking, well, I'm planning the arse off of everything. Our estimates are amazing. We've got brilliant data insights. We've got flight levels implemented. And we get told that we have to go faster and faster. How, how do you like, just like, we're doing everything that we can, short of like busting the balls of everybody who's doing the work. You know, what more is there? And so, like, where do you go with stuff like that? Sorry, um, Chris. Like, I'm just being cathartic now. I'm just telling you all my problems. <laughs> I I, I do think that at some level, and I, I say this cautiously, is that like some organizations are always going to incentivize themselves around that. And at some level, you have a choice to make of if that's the kind of game that you want to play or if you want to play a different type of game. Uh, there are companies out there that are not obsessed with this. Um, I don't think that any company is kind of just going to be coasting along and like it's all going to be, you know, sit around the campfire and, you know, drink some beers or whatever. But there's a definitely a difference between that like aggressive, like hardcore, we have to do all the things and like l nobody cares. You know, there's a lot in between. And so I, I think it's worth considering what type of culture do you want to work in? What kind of culture do you thrive in? What do you enjoy doing? And trying to find something that matches a little bit more to what you need. Because um, life's too short. 